The Foreseen Arcade. Active. Introducing Sega Saturn. Aww, hit it! The Sega Saturn may not have been as big of a success in Europe as the Sony PlayStation was, but this 32-bit system still had a share of decent games. And like any video game platform of the 90s, there is a magazine dedicated to it. Case in point, the Sega Saturn Magazine. The official British magazine, formerly known as simply Sega Magazine. This magazine lasted 37 issues from November of 1995 to November of 1998 and each issue usually cost 275 pounds. One fun thing I love to look up about old magazines is to find some of the games that never got released. One example is Heart of Darkness getting the front cover and a feature in the June 1996 issue, despite the fact that the Saturn version was cancelled. But what I want to talk about today are reviews. I was inspired by Kim Justice's video where they found the worst reviewed games by Amiga Power Magazine, looking at the games that scored 10% or less and giving their thoughts on both the score and the games themselves. I always wanted to try something similar, but I'm much more familiar with 32-bit consoles, both being the PlayStation and, in this case, the Sega Saturn. So I'll start with this magazine in particular. Given that the Saturn library is a lot smaller than the PlayStation, and Sega Saturn magazine didn't last that many issues to begin with, I've decided that any game scored under 60% will qualify. And given that the Saturn lackluster third-party support was outweighed by Sega's high-quality offerings of their own, just being at exactly 60% or higher is enough to be considered average though games that are between 60 and 50% should be considered lucky, because it's all downhill from there. After checking all 37 issues, I found 21 games that fit the criteria. In fact, let's dive in right away. The 14 Arcade is proud to present Sega Saturn Magazine's Worst Rated Games. The first game on the agenda is Independence Day, a 3D shoot'em up released one year after the titular film premiered in theaters. Published by Fox Interactive and developed by Radical Entertainment, the same studio who developed The Simpsons Hit and Run and Crash Tag Team Racing, the game loosely follows the events of a movie, mainly focusing on the action-based sections of a movie Taking on the role of a wingman accompanying Captain Steve Hiller, played by Will Smith, you are tasked with completing various missions in order to fight back against city-destroying spaceships. The game takes place within 13 force-field enclosed zones, ranging from the neon-lit streets of Tokyo to the top-secret airbase known as Area 51. In order to stop the aliens from destroying the Earth's capital cities and humanity as a whole, you must destroy shield generators and or enemy ships before moving on to the next stage. Matt Yo was given the task of reviewing this game for the July 97 issue and he starts off by stating that the world of licensed movie games has always been a shaky one given the long lead times and a lack of support from the movie studios for the developers often result in software houses releasing half-baked titles that only bear a passing resemblance to what audiences remember watching on the big screen. Such was the case with this game, as he wrote that the game is lifeless and unexciting in contrast to the film it was based on when it first premiered in summer of 96. While Matteo did praise the game for having multiplayer options, including split-screen and link-up modes, he criticized the game for its low frame rate, scruffy texture maps, and the repetitive and unimaginative nature of each mission. The frame rate part is especially noticeable on the split-screen multiplayer mode. He also wrote that the biggest disappointment was that Fox Interactive now had a major blot on their otherwise unstained reputation. He mentioned that Fox Interactive's other Saturn offerings, 
Alien Trilogy and Die Hard Trilogy were superb titles, but those were developed by Probe Entertainment, while Independence Day was developed by Radical Entertainment. He made a comparison between both studios regarding the overall quality, saying that Probe's titles seemed to have undergone stricter quality control, while Radical had obviously had their hands tied and have produced a decidedly average 3D shooter up He concluded his review on a 59%, stating that it's yet another average movie licensed game that offers very little variety, excitement or challenge, and that it's best avoided. Given it's the highest rated game on this video, I thought it would be fair to give this game a try, so I could see if his opinion holds up. And upon playing this game, I'll say it's okay for a movie based game, but I am definitely not a fan of the fact that every mission is on a 10 minute time limit, major repair power ups, if you can call them that, only heal you by exactly one measly line in the health bar, and it really is a slog to turn around. Not to mention that on a second mission, the mission briefing was very vague on what I was supposed to do in order to defend whatever they wanted me to defend. Like, should I let the timer go to zero or something? Still, I don't mind some arcade actions in game like this, but I certainly believe there are better alternatives on a Saturn. To be honest, I'm not too interested in the sports genre as a whole, save for indoor sports like bowling or pool, so I won't be able to compare these two games that share the same 58% score, but I still felt it could be worth mentioning in this video as I am curious to see what Sega Saturn magazine had to say about the two. First up we have Frank Thomas Big Hurt Baseball the first title from Acclaim Entertainment to be featured on the list. It was developed by Iguana Entertainment's UK division in Teesside, who also developed other Acclaim titles like Batman Forever and Shadow Man, as well as assisting the main Austin division on the development of Sunsoft's Arrow the Acrobat 2. Big Hurt came out on the Mega Drive and Super Nintendo a year before the Saturn, PlayStation and DOS versions with the 32-bit versions somewhat enhanced of their 16-bit counterparts. Rob gave the game a 58% in the July 96 issue of a magazine, stating that while Big Hurt isn't awful per se, it's just that no UK Saturn owner is going to know who all these players are, since Frank Thomas is not as well known outside the US or care about their fortune on their baseball diamond. He also mentioned that it's nothing you won't have seen on the Mega Drive outside from the multiple camera angles. His review criticizes the complexity, stating it takes about 100,000 years to actually get through the options and stat screens before you even get to play the actual game. While he did give a 71 out of 100 for the graphics, the sound playability and last ability were far lower. He caps the review off saying that Big Hurt Baseball is a fair approximation of a minority sport which probably won't cover any skeptics. Given that the publication didn't have all their reviews listed on Moby Games, I took a quick glance at the overall critical reception for the Saturn version. The highest comes from the French magazine Consoles Plus who gave it an 89%. Their summary, when translated to English, states that it's a good baseball game, but it's better to know a little about the sport to ensure... to ensure what exactly? Ensure that you know the basics of how to play baseball? Well, I guess those unfamiliar with a sport outside the USA and Japan might find it hard to figure out how it works. Meanwhile, the only review that's lower than the one from the Saturn magazine comes from the Video Game Critic, an indie review site that has been active since 1999, who took a look at the game in 2006. The Video Game Critic gave this game a 33% in their retro review, with the biggest problem with the game being the lack of instant replays, 
which is apparently a definite no-no for a sports game made in 1996. The review ends with a video game critic recommending that you're better off sticking with World Series Baseball instead. We now switch from baseball to a sport that SPAL owners are more familiar with. Football. Or soccer for those in the US. FIFA 98, or referring by its full name, FIFA Road to World Cup 98, was the late 1997 edition of FIFA that was meant to coincide with the qualifying procedure for the 1998 World Cup. Though Electronic Arts eventually rebranded the series into EA Sports FC due to their long-time FIFA license finally expiring, it's still FIFA as we know, no matter if it's on the Saturn or the consoles of today. We just didn't have that Ultimate Team loot box or gacha nonsense back then, thankfully. As always, it was released on just about every relevant platform in 1987, with EA's Canadian division in charge of developing the main 32-bit versions, while Extended Play Productions and XYZ Productions handled the 16-bit versions. Sega Saturn Magazine's review of FIFA 98 comes from Lee Nutter, who starts off with this scathing gem. Following on from this steaming heap of cack more commonly referred to as FIFA 97, Electronic Arts are poised to unleash yet another soccer cash cow, the timely FIFA Road to World Cup 98. With a wording like that, I wonder what Mr. Nutter thought of a more modern FIFA slash EA Sports FC titles many years later. In his review, he looked at what FIFA 98 had to offer, including the then up-to-date partnership teams, 16 different stadiums, and 172 international sites. While he was willing to concede that this all sounds very impressive, he then goes on to say that actually playing FIFA 98 is a different matter entirely, suggesting that EA's coders appear to have completely ignored Sega's worldwide titles and produced a formula which led to previous efforts getting quite a slagging. The first thing he criticized was the game's speed, made worse by the very sluggish controls and a noticeable time lag between the button press and the action being executed. I know this is a Saturn version, but I have a feeling that EA developed the game with the PlayStation in mind, as that console had much easier hardware to work with. He also criticized the game's AI stating that at times the player will completely ignore the ball when it's yards in front of them, as if they were blindfolded or something, while the goalkeepers let some outrageously poor strikes into the net. Now, if you don't mind me asking, is the AI any different in other versions of the game? Or is it just on all the versions? He then criticized the graphics, stating that the lack of visual refinement made things considerably worse. How so? According to Lee, despite EA using their motion capture technology for FIFA 98, with David Ginola providing the footage for realism, the player animation is terrible, with the players shuffling along in rather unintentionally humorous fashion. Finally, he concluded his review with this. As you've no doubt gleamed by now, we didn't like FIFA 98 at all, with the infinitely superior Sega Worldwide Soccer 98 already available, it defies logic that anyone will purchase EA's latest lackluster addition to the ailing FIFA series, but they will, crazy fools, they always do. As we already know, he gave FIFA 98 a 58% rating, stating there's little, if anything, to justify purchasing FIFA 98, especially with two excellent worldwide games already available. Though he was rather impressed by the commentary from the Linam, Motson and Great Trio, as well as the use of Song 2 from Blur. I personally found the use of the songs from 
the crystal method much more impressive. Graphics, playability and lastability, not so much. If you think that's scathing, wait until you hear what CVG had to say in their February 1998 issue when they looked at the Saturn version. The only good thing to come out of this game is that it should make everyone buy Worldwide Soccer 98 instead. Quite simply, one of the worst football games ever. Even Everton are better than this. They then slapped the Saturn port with a 1 star rating. Worse than the PlayStation 1 and Nintendo 64 versions of the game, which they reviewed in the same issue. Meanwhile, other publications were mostly positive on the Saturn version, barring the mixed 66% score from EGM. The Portuguese magazine, Megascore, gave it a 93% review score in their March 1998 issue, making it the highest score the Saturn version had out of all publications, though they didn't admit that it is visually lacking compared to the PC original. Understandable given that the PC version had the benefit of using 3DFX glide technology, which was not available to the consoles. Now, like I said, I can't give my honest opinion on either of these two games, since I am generally not into sports games, but I will say, I find it funny how in the screenshots, Lee Nutter warns the readers not to be fooled by the high review marks in other magazines, Sega-centric or otherwise, as well as noting that EA had yet another FIFA title planned for 1998, intending to spotlight the World Cup Finals in Paris. I don't know if it was planned to be released in time for the finals, but one thing is for sure. The next FIFA game did not release on the Saturn, given the system went belly up in the West in 1998. Look at the bright side, Nutter. At least this was the last FIFA game on any Sega system, period. The Dreamcast never got any FIFA titles, as a matter of fact. Another double dipper right away? This is gonna be a rather busy day, isn't it? For our third segment, we are dealing with two games where we are all guns a blazing. One of which had a rather interesting story on how it ended up the way it was on the Saturn. Chaos Control was an FMV rail shooter developed by Infograms, the same company who published Looney Tunes titles in the late 90s and early 2000s. Infograms was also known for Hogs of War, Alone in the Dark, North and South, and V Rally 2. Besides the Saturn version, Chaos Control was also released on MS DOS and Philips CDI, with Macintosh and PlayStation ports coming out the following year, though the latter version only came out in Japan. And while I'm aware that Japan later got a modified and updated version of the Saturn release called Chaos Control Remix, this is not the version I'll be talking about here. I will be focusing on the European version, which is the one that was reviewed on the December 1996 issue. This one is another review written by Bob, who had this rather amusing bit to start things off. They're a bit like bosses really, aren't they? To begin with, the only game to use the Virtua Gun was Virtua Cop, and after an eon of waiting, Mighty Hits, Virtua Cop 2, and Chaos Control all turn up at once. I actually had a bit of fun with this one while recording the footage, and despite using the controller instead of a Virtua Gun or even the Saturn mouse, the aiming didn't feel too bad. In his review, Rob states that while any game that utilizes the much neglected Virtua Gun is welcome, it's obviously better if it had at least some sort of style and panache of a game it was made for, and Chaos Control has nothing of a sort. He mentions that one of the things that makes Virtual Cop so impressive in comparison is the suspense. You're always looking for enemies to pop up behind cars or leap out in front of you. According to his review, all of this is lost in Chaos Control, which simply piles alien after alien in your face 
giving you no real opportunity to target, something which leaves you firing at the screen quite indiscriminately. Then again, it was originally released on the ill-fated Philips CDI, so maybe its nature and gameplay can be forgiven. While he does praise the graphics for its good sense of depth and polished rendering, he finds the smoke effects after destroying an alien unforgivable, as it stays in the air for way too long, which can obscure your view. He also criticized the game for its short length, as the game can be beaten in about 30 minutes. I can confirm that it is that short but that's because I set the game on easy with 9 credits. If I were to play it on hard on the default amount of credits, I imagine it will take me more than 30 minutes to beat it, as it will require me to make many attempts at beating the whole thing from scratch every time I got a game over. In his summary, Rob gave it a 56%, writing that you must be desperate for games that utilize your virtual gun, but Chaos Control is one travesty that will have you pointing your gun at yourself for being a fool enough to buy it. Frankly, given its length, I can't help but agree with him on the last ability bit being a 52%, considering that it was sold for £39.99 at the time. If it was an arcade game and this was a console port, I can imagine the price being more reasonable. But this was a game that was originally released on the DOS and the CDI, so it made a Saturn release somewhat of a mixed bag, despite being available for a console that was somewhat more successful than the same console that had Hotel Mario and the Animation Magic developed Zelda titles. If you are curious and want to try this game out, the DOS version did get an official re-release on Steam and it's currently selling for 7 euro, or even cheaper if you get it during a sale. The second game to have the same review score comes from the February 1997 issue. The game in question? The Saturn port of Doom, released one year after the PS1 version and three years after the original DOS release, the Saturn port was handled by the British developer Rage Software. But as Rich Ledbetter of Digital Foundry fame mentioned in his review, the port looks so dull. The bespoke lightning in the Williams developed PS1 port is gone and many of the effects and background designs from the PC original were absent. He also wrote that the 32X version of Doom was a far better port for the Sega system, despite the fact that the 32X port was rushed and had borders. His review goes on to compare Lobotomy Software's Exhumed, aka Power Slave, to this port, and it's clear that this port has no redeeming qualities. Oh yeah, and he also mentions the game's slow frame rate especially when more than a few enemies are present at, it at one time. Since Rich played every Doom port that was released at the time, he wrote that while the Saturn port is surpassed only by Art Data Interactive's disastrous 3D port, with the tiny window, jerkier performance and all, he still writes that the Jaguar and even the 32X versions were more playable. He ends the review stating that while Exhumed slash Power Slave still rules the genre on a Saturn, he hoped that GT Interactive could redeem themselves with the Saturn port of Hexen. And in case you were wondering, Atot AB, who developed Hot Wheels Extreme Racing for the PS1, handled the Saturn conversion of Hexen. Now that I've tried Doom on the Saturn, I can easily see what Rich meant regarding the jerky frame rate, but there was a good reason why it ended up that way. Upon receiving the necessary resources from ID Software, Jim Bagley, who was the programmer of the Saturn port, created a hardware accelerated renderer for the platform in a jiffy. However, John Carmack, one of the original creators of Doom at ID Software, 
was none too pleased with the rendering engine due to the Saturn's quad-based affine texture scaling. Carmack demanded that the said hardware graphics capabilities be avoided altogether, forcing Bagley to write a software renderer that utilized both SH2 processor units in the system, under the coordination of the central 68000 chip to draw the screen, similar to the PC game engine. That being said, the decision to disallow 3D acceleration is one Carmack will later regret, as he admitted on October 8, 2014, that he hated Affine Texture Slim and Integral Quadverts, but in hindsight, he probably should have let him experiment. Had he allowed the Saturn version to use 3D hardware, it might have been on par with the PlayStation version, even if a lot of its features were removed. I was able to tolerate the frame rate since it allowed me to take my time instead of rushing through the whole thing. But yeah, I have to agree with Rich's review on this one. It's definitely not one of the best Doom ports for consoles out there. But I still played this version of the 3DO port, that's for sure. Now, as well as the 56% score is, at least Rich's review is far more forgiving than what other publications said at the time. CPG in particular gave the sport 1 star out of 5, saying, quote, The biggest problem is that the frame rate is ridiculously low, almost entirely locking up at times, making the game slow, jerky and nearly impossible to play. Even more annoying is the way the game was rushed out before Christmas with high resolution PC Doom screenshots on the packaging. There's no excuse. One of the greatest games of all time has been destroyed and everyone involved in this version should be shot. Sheesh, these guys have no chill. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special report. Good evening. Unexpected meteor showers have been reported over North America, Europe, and Asia, causing widespread damage and disruption to many communication systems. The National Weather Service reports. Oh, what is going on? In Al, what is. Released in 1995. Shockwave Assault brings both Shockwave and its Operation Jumpgate expansion together and made it accessible for systems other than a 3 do Besides the Saturn, Shockwave Assault was also released on PC, Macintosh, PlayStation, and, oddly enough, the Apple Bandai Pippin. In Shockwave, you take the role of a rookie pilot defending the Earth from an alien invasion. From the cockpit of the F-177 fighter, you shoot at the alien walkers and fighters with lasers and missiles, rearming and refueling at supply depots when necessary. The story is told through live-action cutscenes, which was a common thing for the likes of the 3DO and other early CD-based consoles like the Commodore CD-TV or the Mega CD add-on for the Mega Drive. The Operation Jumpgate expansion continues the story with several additional missions set around the solar system. Originally developed by Advanced Technology Group for the original 3DO version, this is another game from Electronic Arts. But luckily for me, it's not a sports game this time around. And believe it or not, it's not the only 3DO game that also saw a Saturn release, but we'll get to that in a bit. This review comes from the July 1996 issue, with Rob once again being assigned to the job. Right off the bat, he criticized the gameplay as somewhat lacking, with most of the objectives boiling down to just shooting aliens, while others requiring you to protect oil refineries or to destroy a specific target, and some missions simply have you roaming about. His review says that the game's repetitive nature contributed to its utter blandness and mentions that Shockwave Assault somewhat reminds him of Time Wars, a game that was similar not only in its bland approach to gameplay, but also in its cheesy live-action FMV cutscenes. Coincidentally, Time Wars is actually part of the next segment, 
but I'll get there in a moment, as I'm still busy with Shockwave Assault. After his criticisms of the visuals, the crossfire detection and the annoyance at the radio chatter from the commander and pilots on the monitor, he ends the review stating that Shockwave Assault is a bit of a disaster all around, what with bland, repetitive gameplay, substandard graphics, and the usual dose of NAF FMV. Once again, diving into Moby Games' archives, Shockwave Assault had a bit of a mixed reception. The German publication Megafun gave it 84 out of 100, while French magazine Consoles Plus gave it an 81 out of 100. The latter of which, when translated, reads, Shoot 'em ups are rare on 32 bits, so I have to admit that this one lets off steam as much as possible, even if it doesn't offer anything transcendent, neither in its graphics nor in a variety of actions. The only English reviews of the Saturn version are from Mean Machines and EGM, both giving 84 out of 100 and 17.5 out of 40 respectively. Mean Machines in particular wasn't impressed with the game, as the overall score section had them saying that this is a criminal underuse of the Saturn's potential. Oh dear, this one's a real doozy. We have three Saturn games that share the same 54% score, but there are some really interesting things to talk about here. First, we have Titan Wars, also known in the US as Solar Eclipse. This was developed by Crystal Dynamics, the same studio behind Legacy of Kane, Gex, and the post-core design Tomb Raider games. In fact, this is actually a sequel to Solar Eclipse, another game that originally came out on the 3DO. Like its predecessor, it's a 3D spaceflight simulation shooter akin to Space Harrier that takes place on and near the many moons of Saturn, well, the planet, not the console, and you take control of a hotshot pilot with a troubled path, who's been reassigned to a new squadron aboard a Tomlinson-class carrier. There's trouble on a mining colony on the moon Yamos, and your squadron is sent in to investigate, all covering a lot more than they bargained for. The story in this game is told through a series of full motion video clips. In addition to between level scenes, FMV messages from your squad mates appear from time to time while you play the game. Rob yet again shows up for this video, as the one behind the review from the March 1996 issue. He starts the review saying that shoot 'em ups on the Saturn have taken on new standard since Panzer Dragoon. A game either has to try and match its 3D polygon muscles or go for a more retrofied 2D side scrolling approach, as is the case with nostalgic Darius. Since Panzer Dragoon 2 was yet to be released at the time, Rob wrote that in such an environment, a game like Time Wars stands little chance of survival. It chooses the head-on 3D perspective, much like its 3DO predecessor, and makes a bit of a shambles of it. He first criticized the ship movement, saying it jitters like it got the hiccups or something, making negotiating valleys and caves more difficult on top of the oversensitive control. The fact that each level only has two restart points certainly doesn't help matters. While he did say the 3D environments aren't all bad, their lack of imagination was unforgivable. The challenges themselves were equally uninspiring, as most of the time you just dodge steel girders, shoot down towers, and airborne enemies, and beat a boss at the end of the level. Isn't this a bit like how the predecessor was, given it did play a bit like Spare Terrier? What really sealed Time Wars mediocrity to him were the FMV cutscenes which dragged on for too long. On the topic of the FMV cutscenes, he wrote down a scenario he pictured on what might have happened at Crystal Dynamics while making Time Wars. There they all were putting the finishing touches to the FMV sequences in the game. 
actors were neurotically concentrating on their Stanislavski technique in preparation of a big finale, the director and cinematographer were arguing about the depth of field ratio, and the special effects team were penciling in the finishing touches on the computer. Finally, it all came together, and they got the take. Smiling, each one of them sat down and lit a self-satisfied cigarette. There was silence. Suddenly, one of them jumps up. The game! Oh my god, we've forgotten about the game! Confused reply, what game? What are you talking about? You know, the game that's supposed to go with the FMV sequences? Or was it meant to be the other way around? In a rush, they head down to Programming Central and knock out the game overnight with the help of some strong coffee and a few cut corners. Unfortunately for us, it's too little, too late. Once again, it was off to the Moby Games archive, and that's when I found out that more publications chose to review the Saturn version than the PlayStation version. The highest score comes from Game Fan Magazine, in which the bloke they chose to write the review states the following. I can honestly say that it's not only one of the deepest shooters in gameplay, but design as well. The tunnel system in this game is fantastic. Graphically, Crystal Dynamics pushes the Saturn close to the edge with insane texture, super fast 3D, and cavernous worlds. The accompanying story and constant coming from the squadron actually add to the gameplay, and the music is excellent. Crystal Dynamics is the new king of the shooters. That review gave it a 92 out of 100. Electric Playground, a vintage online outlet, also gave it a blazing review with an 8 out of 10 score. Victor Lucas, who wrote the review, stated that it's the best shooter to come from Crystal Dynamics, even suggesting it's even better than the 3DO predecessor or its updated PS1 release. EGM shared the same sentiment on how this game was a massive improvement over Total Eclipse and gave it a 31 out of 40. The weakest review comes once again from the video game critic, giving it a 25 out of 100 in their retro review. The second game to share the 54% score is Alone in the Dark 2 Jack is Back. Also known as Alone in the Dark 2 One-Eyed Jack's Revenge, or simply Alone in the Dark 2, this is a follow-up to the classic survival horror game from Infograms. Much like the predecessor, it was originally released on PC in 1993 before being ported to other platforms, first being the Japanese exclusive FM Town and PC-98 versions in 1994, the Interplay published 3DO port in 1995, and finally PlayStation and Saturn conversions in 1996. While the original DOS version was well received by the press, the console conversions had a mixed reception. The Saturn version in particular got the rough end of a stick, with Rob Bright being assigned to review the port. Could it be the same Rob as some of the other reviews I looked at earlier? Hmm. In his review, he wrote that after the success of the original Unknown in the Dark series on PC, Infograms had made the bold step of releasing the sequel on the Saturn. But courage is blind at times, you know. He states that the graphics are nothing to write home about, with the lack of fine tuning leaving it looking a bit flat. The animation was also ridiculed, considering the way that Edward Carnby picks up clues or fires his Tommy gun as having all the charisma of a cardboard cutout. The shooting was also criticized, as getting the right aim was difficult to judge. He concludes the review stating that what starts out as an ambitious and intriguing RPG is quickly ruined by major flaws in the game logic, leading to the kind of frustration that makes you want to kill fluffy animals. Okay, first of all, this is a survival horror game, not an RPG. The second, 
with that kind of thinking in the last bit, you probably may want to consider fighting a psychiatrist. Either that, or being thrown into the rocks, like so. My leg. The last game in this trio is a rather interesting title. By 1998, the Saturn was starting to receive less games from third-party publishers, making the offerings especially scarce in Europe. Meanwhile, the Saturn was thriving in Japan despite stiff competition from Sony, getting new games on a regular basis. With Sega already looking to pull the plug on the Saturn in the West and shifting focus on the Dreamcast, Sega Saturn Magazine decided to review several Japanese imports in their later issues, in hopes to find some of the games that will be worth paying the import fees. Given that Saturn is region locked, you will need some specific tools and know-how to run these on your PAL model. Of all the import reviews, this is the only game that managed to fall into the criteria for this video. Published by Yalako in 1998 as a Japanese exclusive, GT24 is actually a modified port of the 1996 arcade game Super GT 24 Hours, which in turn makes it the last Model 2 conversion for the Saturn. It was also the last game to make it on this video chronologically, as it was from the August 1998 issue of a magazine. One new track was added to the console version for a total of three in both regular and reverse configurations, two new vehicles added for a total of six, and five different pit crews. Lee Nutter was taking the keys to take GT24 for a test drive, and he was very disappointed with this conversion of Yalako's competent arcade racer. He criticized the game for its distinct lack of gameplay variations and secret options, no split-screen two-player mode, custom car options or hidden tracks, and he finally wrote that it consummately fails to live up to the high standards of Sega's own Model 2 conversions, lacking the visual impact and depth of play of comparative titles. This is a pretty stark contrast, as the review page does say it was receiving rave reviews in Japan. For this entry, we have another game that originates from the 3DO, and another game to be published by Acclaim, this time being a movie tie-in. Both have a 53% score, so let's find out why. First released on the 3DO and later ported to other, more popular systems a year later, Johnny Bazooka Tone was developed by Arc Developments Limited and published by US Gold, the publisher best known for porting a plethora of arcade games to 8-bit and 16-bit micros. In fact, US Gold even made a big claim that its original 3DO release was the UK's first 32-bit platformer. Players take control of a titular Johnny Bazooka Tom, who has been imprisoned in the year 2050 in Sin Sin Prison by El Diablo, the Lord of the Underworld, who is jealous of his talent and kidnaps other musical legends as well. The reason behind it is that El Diablo was jealous of Johnny and his band. So he kidnapped the guitar Anita, and he found out that he absolutely sucks at playing music after he tried playing it on her. And so he was furious enough to kidnap rock, techno, jazz and soul geniuses. And so it's up to Johnny to rescue Anita, as well as the rest of the musical legends as well, and take on El Diablo himself. Interestingly, the game's soundtrack includes a title track contributed by Bon Jovi guitarists Richie Sambora and Tico Torres. In fact, the PAL version of the PlayStation and Saturn versions even come with the game's official soundtrack. That's pretty nifty, don't you think? 
The review from the February 1996 issue is written by Sam Hickman this time. His first criticism was that all the CG rendered sprites, except the small ones, are really blurry and fuzzy, complete with a lack of detail on the characters. Gameplay wise, the enemies pop out of nowhere and there's a tricky, spiky tree that takes away a third of your life bit in the first level. He concluded his review calling it an all-round disappointing effort that is both dull and frustrating to play. Over at Moby Games, the Saturn version is actually the most well-received release by the press, at least by the 11 publications that had a chance to review it, with the Moby score of 7.1. Saturn Plus gave it a 94 out of 100, stating that it's a visually stunning platform with a rocking soundtrack. Not all that great, but great fun. GameFan Magazine gave it an 83 out of 100, and the reviewer there said that he would have preferred a more happening rockstar, like a purple pompadour, but otherwise he found JB quite enjoyable. Johnny Bazooka Tone took a while to get feel for, but once he figured the con buttons to the right and got into it, he found this a well thought out and unique adventure with great visuals, cool CG and brain twisting levels. He believed a sequel is in order, but let's face it, that ain't gonna happen. The absolute worst score comes from a review by the video game critic in 2013 giving an eye-opening 0%. Blues music plays throughout Johnny Bezogaton, and according to his retro review, it's appropriate considering how sad this game will make you feel. The other game with a 53% score is a video game adaptation of Space Jam, developed by Sculpture Software and published by Acclaim. Based on a movie starring Michael Jordan, Space Jam centers around an invasion of the Looney Tunes universe by tiny aliens. The fate of the tunes is to be decided by a basketball game, and for this, the aliens turn into the huge evil monsters. And yes, this is a film that introduced everyone to the fan favorite Lola Bunny. Practically, it plays a bit like Midway's NBA Jam which Acclaim had the rights to make home ports of that game, but with minigames thrown in for good measure. The game itself is a free on free basketball game, the first of its kind on the Saturn, and features the Looney Tunes Posse and the basketball legend Michael Jordan. You get to choose between two squad and monsters, both with their own characters and stats to pick from. Each of the characters comes with their own stats speed, shooting, and rebound. The game is divided into four quarters with these being intersected with minigames which can be turned off, if you wish. The review comes from the 1997 issue from May, and the ball was passed over to Lee Nutter. He wrote that the biggest disappointment came from both gameplay and graphics, as Space Jam hardly pushes the limits of a Saturn, showing us little that couldn't be done on the Mega Drive with the players being 2D sprites as opposed to the 3D polygon players. He also balked at the lack of innovations in the gameplay besides the minigames, the addition of an extra player serving to confuse the proceedings as well as repetitive gameplay. And all from single player mode alone since it's one of those games that's way better to play with friends. He ends the review saying that with NBA Jam Extreme, also by acclaim, already on the market with 3D motion capture players and packing loads of moves and hidden extras, that NBA Jam Extreme outclasses Space Jam in every way. It may not be as good as NBA Jam Extreme, Mr. Nutter, but you should have heard what CVG had to say in their review. In their review, they gave it a 1 out of 5, stating that younger gamers might like this, but as for the rest, steer well clear. The gameplay and challenge is too basic. A tragic waste of not only the movie license, but the Looney Tunes characters as well. And I must agree with CVG on that. 
acclaims tie-in was a tragic waste of both the license and Looney Tunes, at least until a new legacy came out, and somehow makes acclaims tie-in look like Elder Ring by comparison. And I'm talking about the movie, not the free Xbox One game from Digital Eclipse, in case you're wondering. Oh boy, yet another acclaimed game on the list. And this time, it looks like they are accompanied by an EA game this time. Not only do they share the same 49% score, but I also find it funny that this is the third appearance for these two publishers, all sharing the same segment. At least for EA, third time's the charm given that this is the last time they show up on the video. Acclaim. Not so much, as you will find out soon enough. First is Street Fighter The Movie, developed by Capcom and is yet again published by Acclaim. Being that it's based on a movie, which itself is based on a video game, the characters are all presented via digitized sprites, all done by the film's own actors, with the exception of Blade, due to his moves being way too similar to Kano from Mortal Kombat. The main mode is Street Battle, which is basically arcade or tournament mode like Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo was. There is a story mode, which follows the story of a movie using FMVs in between fights. And a trial mode, where the player takes on Guile in a range of different battle events to test their skills. This one is when things get really fun as it was reviewed in the very first issue from November of 1995, and the writer of the review is the amazingly, charmingly named Radeon Automatic. Seriously, Radeon Automatic. That is an awesome name. His first strike against the game was the fact that it's not even a port of a coin up but rather a different game that's more akin to Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo. His other complaint is the slow game speed. How bad is that exactly? His example was that if both players fire a projectile move and one of them tries to jump at the same time, you've got to go and make a cup of tea, drink it and have a slice of cake before either of you can do anything else. All the reviews for the Saturn version were mixed, obviously, but the most scathing review came from a retro review from Defunct Games, which the site gave it a 6 out of 100 in 2004. And now on to our final EA game on the video, and for this one we head back to the July 1997 issue, as it was reviewed alongside Independence Day. Given that EA handled the publishing of the latter game's European release, it certainly makes sense. Battle Stations was a naval combat game developed by Real Time Associates, where we get all the fun of being in the Navy on the Saturn, except uh, without the village people, and thankfully without the jokes of whatever those seamen get up to behind closed portholes. <laughs> During the game, players are moving their ships strategically on an overhead map. When two ships move close enough to each other, a battle can be triggered. During the battle, players try maneuvering a target reticule on their opponent's ship to attack them, while also attempting to move out of the way of their opponent's attack. Once one of the ship's health meters become empty from taking too much damage, they are sunk and it's off for them to the Davy Jones locker. Outside of a retro review from a German website, Maniac, Saturn Magazine is the only publication, as far as I know, to even bother reviewing this game. And not a good score, I will tell you that right now. In his review, Gary Kotlack wrote that it has a complete lack of reality in the campaign mode. For example, a massive aircraft carrier can be spun around on the spot by simply holding down the D-pad in one direction. I mean, it will be way less exciting as it will take 12 hours to come to a halt like in real life. But he did say it could have benefited from a slight increase in realism. 
Other than that, he did say that there were a few good ideas there and there, but shockingly bad presentation and amazingly simple gameplay helped this title to sink like the Titanic. His summary states that after the triumphant release of Soviet Strike, it comes as a grave disappointment to announce that this is poor, with battle stations being regarded as a very shallow, haha, <laughs> ocean based title that should be avoided. Now, let's just say that the demo for the PlayStation version did a poor job at providing a good first impression, but now that I got to try the Saturn version for the video, it's actually not too bad of a game once you get to the grips of the controls. Anyway, Courier Crisis was developed by New Level Software and published by BMG Interactive Entertainment, with GT Interactive releasing it in the US. You take control of a bicycle courier as you pick up and deliver packages from one grumpy customer to the other grumpy customer within a time limit, all while pulling off jumps and tricks, avoiding cars, kicking the rather angry dogs out of the way, and smacking or running into innocent bystanders. While I am far from finished in this video, it was chronologically the last PAL release to qualify for the video. With the exception of Deep Fear, the reviews of the last remaining issues until November of 1998 focused on Japanese imports. Lee Nutter gave Courier Crisis the old college try in the June 1998 issue and he clearly knew what went wrong. First, he gave a bit of a context of what was happening at the time. On the face of it, Sega Europe appeared to have avoided the glut of second-rate software which appears to be causing Sony more than a few headaches at the moment. Their quality over quantity policy looks to have paid off, with recent releases being of an exceptional standard. Witness Panzer Dragoon Saga, Burning Rangers, and WLS-98. So, why on earth would they want to spoil things by releasing the god-awful Courier Crisis? He criticized the game for its graphics as it was lacking in visual refinement, lacking variety in the 15 or so levels, suffered from poor collision detection and terrible controls. His last paragraph states that there is little point in denying that Sega of Europe have plunged to new depths to pad out their dwindling UK release schedule, while the likes of Grandia, Dead or Alive and Vampire Sta Savior are destined to remain in import-only territory. The overall summary reads as follows. Quality over quantity my arse. Courier Crisis is the worst Saturn game we've received this year by some considerable way. A Konami game being on the list of poorly received games on the Saturn? Yeah, I was surprised as you are. Released on PC and consoles two years after its original arcade release, Crypt Killer is a horror themed light gun shooter where you have to shoot through countless hordes of monsters, from skeletons to mummies, to find the eyes of guidance across six stages. While I have no clue how the arcade version was received, its console ports were met with a mixed reception. But as the video game critic said in his retro review, Cryptkiller won't win any awards, but its simple arcade charm makes it worthy of a quick romp. While the Saturn version was lacking in the graphics department, it does have better controls than on its PlayStation 1 counterpart. But still, Lee Nutter's review from May 1997 pretty much summarizes how rough it must have been for Konami to port it to home systems. While his criticism toward the graphics were pretty much expected from the Saturn version, 
He did state the port had done little to expand upon to make it a lasting experience. Not to mention the fact that it is actually easier to play the game with the standard Saturn controller, as reloading was made far too easy to justify the Virtua Gun. Sega Saturn Magazine also gave us a bonus bit called Fun with a Gun, where they ranked the previously reviewed games that utilized the Virtua Gun peripheral, with Virtua Cop 1 and 2 being the best games for the Virtua Gun, Drift Killer's 47 score lead to the game being dead last, which they consider to be worse than Chaos Control. Huh, maybe Lean Other has something of a soft spot for Infogram's FMV shooter, maybe? Okay, this one is a bit silly. A lot gun shooter from the arcade starring Aerosmith, where you have to rescue the band and liberate the youth from the clutches of Headmistress Helga and the New Order Nation. How do you do it? By shooting down their henchmen using a laser blaster and explosive CDs. I guess that's what they meant by the tagline, music is the weapon. Since it was developed by Midway, the same company who gave us Mortal Kombat, it's no surprise to know that once again, Acclaim is involved with the publishing of the port one year later. And yeah, this is the fourth time Acclaim gets the short end of a stick from Sega Saturn magazine. Rob was once again picked to review this in a May 1996 issue, starting his review saying that while the idea behind Revolution X is to save Aerosmith, why you'd want to save Aerosmith is another matter entirely. And right out of the gate, he considers it to be one of the worst games yet to appear on the Saturn, limping leprously past the likes of Johnny Bazooka Tone and Time Wars, due to the game going for the conventional 2D approach over the 3D graphics of Virtua Cop. As you might imagine, this was from a time that 3D was mandatory to be taken seriously on the new hardware, as anything 2D on a 32-bit platform was immediately shunned, even if, ironically, some of the 3D games would age like cottage cheese by today's standards. Rob's review wasn't exactly long, but he did say that, much like we saw with Chaos Control, it fails to learn from the likes of Virtua Cop in terms of suspense, where enemies appear from behind cars, bursting through doors, etc. instead going for a pile out all your falls at you indiscriminately route. He concludes the review with an overall statement that Revolution X is an incredibly bland and monotonous game matched only by the blandness and monotony of a band that endorsed it. Obviously this is not one of Midway's best works, and it seems that others happen to agree on that. GamePro US gave the Saturn version a 2 out of 5, stating that Acclaim would have had a better chance marketing Revolution X as an expensive coaster. I'm no marketing advisor, but I don't think anyone would want to market a video game that way. Except maybe for Concord. While Japan is usually the first thing to come to mind regarding regional exclusives, Europe had a fair share of games that never made it to North America. Sega Saturn in particular had a total of 10 games that were PAL exclusive, with Formula Cards Special Edition, Discworld 2, Atlantis The Lost Tales, Jonah Lomo Rugby, and the Saturn port of the Bitmap Brothers strategy game Z being notable highlights. Out of all of these, however, 
Trash It was considered to be the weakest of a bunch by most fans of a Saturn. Developed by Rage Software, who also did Jonah Lomu Rugby and the Saturn version of Doom, and published by GT Interactive, you control a construction worker and your goal is to destroy stuff with a hammer and vacuum the debris for points in each level. As you progress through the quest mode, you can also purchase different hammers with varying stats to help you out in the process, given that each level is on a time limit. I actually first learned about the game when I played the demo of the PS1 version on a disc that also had the demo for Robotron X and Command and & Conquer. And I honestly thought it wasn't too bad of a game, if a bit simplistic. Gary Kotlack, on the other hand, was not exactly impressed when he reviewed it for the December 1997 issue. Things got off to a bad start when he wrote that GT Interactive conveniently forgot to send Sega Saturn Magazine an advanced review copy. His review went on to tear down Trash It for being repetitive, the fact that you cannot run while holding a hammer, and his graphics featuring lots and lots of brow. The only saving grace he mentioned was the fact that it was sold for a bargain price of £34.99. But that was probably more out of shame on the publisher's part. With the Saturn version's reviews being scarce, the PlayStation version scored a Moby score of 6.8, so it might be somewhat enjoyable on the PlayStation, but if you would pick any PAL exclusive game for the Saturn to try out, Trash It is certainly not one of them. We now have the fifth Saturn game from Acclaim. Sheesh, these guys just cannot catch a break. Iron Man and XO Man of War in Heavy Metal was developed by Real Time Associates and is a linear beat-em-up which serves as a crossover between the comic book world from Marvel and Valiant Comics, known as Acclaim Comics at the time. Since it was released in 1996, it was one of the early games for both PlayStation and Saturn. While on Sony's console it was far better than Fantastic Four, which Acclaim also published, it was a different story for Sega's underdog. A lot of the critic reviews saw the game as mediocre at best, with GameSpot giving the game a 5.2 out of 10, stating that it feels as though it was hastily thrown together, resulting in a game that could have easily used another 6 months of development. The most scathing review came from CVG, whose 1 out of 5 review calls it a complete ripoff, an appalling game, and a big black mark next to Acclaim's name. But what does Sega Saturn Magazine think of it in their April 1996 issue? Well, let's just say that Lee Nutter is somewhat in the same camp, as he pointed out it runs on the same engine as their then-recent Batman Forever, which explains the game's poor graphics and the disappointing use of motion capture. Alongside the music and objectives being identical, the repetitive gameplay and lack of variety in moves or weapons, he also goes out of the way to say that if a claim had a quality control department, all those in it should be on the receiving end of a brutal kicking for letting this one through the net. Needless to say, this game ended up with a 33% score. If you haven't been keeping track by now, this is a 6th Saturn game on the video to be published by Acclaim, and without a doubt it's the worst game they put out on the system. At least they can finally rest easy now, given it's their final appearance in this video. Developed by the Norwegian-based studio Funcom, Dragonheart Fire and Steel is based on the titular movie that stars David Quaid, with Draco being voiced by the late Sean Connery. Dragonheart puts you in the sweaty medieval shoes of a dragon hunter, Bowen, as he faces the last dragon still surviving, ending up befriending one named Draco. With his help, 
he goes after King Anon, a former pupil of a dragon hunter who has turned more horrible than a month old half eaten pork pie. Lee Nutter did the review for the May 1996 issue, and he criticized the game for the levels being samey, the fact it cost £40 for something this poorly made, the lousy graphics, the lack of two player mode, the dodgy collision detection, boring combat, non existent AI, and lack of variety in the range of moves or weapons. It was so bad, Lee Nutter ended the review saying that he'd rather have his testicles surgically removed without anesthetic than to play Dragon Hot before slapping it with a 27% score. Ouch. While we're on the topic of dragons, we now take a look at Blazing Dragons, based on the Nelvana cartoon of the same name by the late great Terry Jones of Multipython fame. Crystal Dynamics is once again getting the rough end of a stick from Sega Saturn magazine, but unlike Titan Wars, they didn't develop this point and click adventure game themselves. Instead, it was developed by the Illusions Gaming Company, who would later develop PC games based on Duckman and MTV's Beavis and Butthead. You take control of Flicker, an inventor who wants to become a knight and win the tournament so he can marry his lifelong love interest, Princess Flame. But things get complicated when the humans announce their entry to the tournament with their mechanical black dragon and if they win, they will take over the royal palace. This serves as a perfect opportunity for Flicker to fulfill his destiny to become a squire, then a knight, then to win the tournament and Princess Flame's hand in marriage. As you can see, this is a point and click adventure game where you have to solve various problems as you progress through the story. Rob reviewed the game on December 1996 and oh boy, he ain't happy about it. He had a lot of things to say when criticizing the game for its plot, the dialogue, the puzzles, the humor, the animations, the hand painted backgrounds and the voice acting. Rob gave it a 23% calling it one of the most cringeworthily irritating, unfunny games of all time. Now let me get this straight. A game that was published by the developers behind the Gex and Legacy of Kane series, partially produced by the director of Monty Python and the Holy Grail, one of the funniest movies ever made, is considered to be cringeworthily irritating and unfunny. Well, let's see what others have to say on Moby Games. <laughs> okay, in all seriousness, the Saturn version wasn't talked about that much by the critics, with Edge and GameSpot reviews being the only recorded reviews in English, but the rest of the publications who did play the Saturn version were pretty be delighted by it. I guess Rob never even watched any films or skits from Monty Python to understand the game's British humor. But hey, look on the bright side, Flicker. At least he didn't end up with a game as bad as our final entry on this list. Yep, it's this game alright. A game based on the Marvel Comics superhero, it was reviled by the press, and it's not from Acclaim. Relax! Relax! You heard me right. It's not a claim this time around. Instead, the blame lies on Eidos Interactive and attention to detail, with additional help from Silicon Dreams. This game already got plenty of vitriol on the PlayStation, but the Saturn version takes the cake for its nasty response. All Game Guide's 1.5 out of 5 review calls The Incredible Hulk the Pantheon Saga as one of those games that is just so bad 
that you wonder why it has ever been released. But the most gaming review for the Saturn has to come from none other than Stephen Full James, as seen on the April 1986 issue. And yes, that's the same issue we saw the review for Iron Man and Exile Man of War, and it was somehow even worse than Acclaim's Marvel title. Yes, just let that sink in for a moment. The blurb for the review says that Marvel characters gain their superpowers by either a bite from a radioactive animal or being exposed to a lethal gamma radiation. We know that the Hulk falls into the latter category, but it's safe to say it feels like attention to detail and idols deserve to be subjected to both. His review starts off with him saying that the Incredible Hulk, the Pantheon Saga, is without a doubt the worst Saturn game he'd ever had the misfortune to play ever. And he had to review Duel. He then lists the issues of the game. The first problem was that the game completely ignores the abilities of the character and how unfaithful it is to the comics due to the fact that it's a 3D exploration game akin to Gremlin Interactive's Loaded, in which the Hulk has to find switches and whatnot to open doors and activate lifts, rather than, you know, smash through the doors and climb up the lift shaft. The next problem listed in his review were the graphics, with its boring and jerky 3D environments and appalling draw distance. Especially the sprites for the Hulk himself, looking like if someone tried to make an action figure out of green cheese and broccoli, slapped together with pipe cleaners and tried to do stop motion animations with it. Along with a criticism to the sound, gameplay and no long term or short term playability, he ends the review with this. So the Incredible Hulk is not quite a AAA release. It's another one of those games which the publisher has quietly slipped into the shops hoping they'll sell with a few ads and no reviews. I'm not trying to be funny or clever by giving it such a low mark. The simple fact is that I cannot adequately describe just how bad it is. I can't imagine for a second that the developers looked at what they had and thought, yeah, that's great, let's release it now. I'm surprised that Eidos had the audacity to even release it, and I doubt that Marvel will be overjoyed with the end product either. The simple fact is that The Incredible Hulk is absolutely awful. It's an embarrassment to Eidos, to the developers, to Marvel, and to the Saturn in general. Well, this has been a rather interesting journey today. It's often fun to look back at the magazines from the past and have a laugh at some of the most absurd reasoning behind the scores, especially those from the UK. But if I had to choose which game actually isn't as bad as the magazine claims it is, I will have to go with the following. First, Doom. Mainly because I can at least understand how it ended up like that, and I can at least forgive John Carmack after he admitted his error. Next, Blazing Dragons, because it's actually a fun game if you're familiar with the genre and have a knack for British humor. Chaos Control, because it's cheap to get on Steam nowadays, but still enjoyable. Trash It, even the weakest of a PAL exclusive offerings can provide some enjoyment. Alone in the Dark 2, because it's still faithful to the DOS original despite its flaws, and I believe it should be worth a look. And finally, Revolution X and Crypt Killer, as they are still charming in their own ways, for being arcade conversions. With that said, what do you think of the games and how Sega Saturn Magazine thought of them? Do you have a particular game you actually enjoyed? Do you actually re agree with one of the reviews? Feel free to let me know in the comments down below. And as always, thank you for watching. And I'll see you next time on the Foreseen Arcade. Tara for now. <laughs>